Well, it's, well after the 4th of July, yesterday was quite refreshing. So, you know, this is a beautiful day. And uh, so if you would uh, stand up and join us in our first praise song, and uh, just, you know, just have a great time to be alive. Thank you. 
before we get into drive, we don't usually do uh, commercials, but um, I don't, I'm sure you all can hear I'm kind of struggling, so I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be able to do this. My voice is getting more gravelly every day. So if there's anybody out there that wants to come sing with us, and we, we're so, we got one volunteer out there, um, you, we certainly, we practice on Thursday nights at 6.30, so anyone is welcome. If you want to come help us, we would appreciate it. Okay, and this is Thrive. <clears throat>
You guys awesome? Thank you, Alex. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome here in the name of Christ as we come together to worship the Lord and to lift our hearts together. And it is true that the words of that song, it, it seems like sometimes that's all we're doing is, is surviving. Just trying to get from one day to the next. Sometimes it feels like we're just trying to get from one minute to the next minute. But you know what? God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Well, uh, God is good and God is answering prayers. Those young, young boys over trapped in that cave with their coach. Uh, understand this morning, four of them are confirmed out of the cave. Amen. And we're praying for the rest of them. Amen. So we continue to pray that all of them make it out safe and, and uh, those uh, rescue workers make it out safe as well. We're grateful for those uh, folks over there helping them. So keep praying for that. Keep praying about that. Another thing I want to share with you real quick. Uh, there is a baby shower planned here the next Saturday at 1 o'clock. That's July 14th at 1 o'clock uh, right here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. It is for Jake and Katie Ekstrand, so uh, we want to celebrate uh, uh, that joy in their life and that excitement in their life. Lunch will be served. Now, you do need to let Kathy know, it says here, please, please RSVP by the 6th, which is uh, like yesterday, I think, or something like that. So I think if you let her know today or tomorrow, that, that should be okay. Uh, if you need her phone number, see me after worship, and I'm going to... Go put this on the bulletin board out there in the hall as you go down. So there's what it looks like. And it is a couple show. It is a couple show. Yeah, That's right. Men and women are invited. All right. So none of them lady games and right. baby games and <laughs> all that kind of fun. Okay. So and a couple are registered at Amazon and Target. So if you want to uh, put in Jake and Katie Ekstrand. Anyway, this will be out on the bulletin board. So. All right, good morning. And my tie says good morning to you. <laughs> happy faces. You know why they are happy? They are happy because they had bacon and eggs for oh. breakfast. <laughs> Amen. Here comes that crazy bacon egg. song, I think. Egg. Bacon and eggs. Egg. There you go. <laughs> Welcome your neighbor with bacon and eggs. <laughs> bacon and eggs. <laughs> I would really love to have those here this week if you could. Uh, if you can't, if don't put them in my office, put them in the library. My office has turned into a forest. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. All right, well, let us uh, open our hearts uh, to the Lord in prayer. And, and we thank God for those uh, uh, young boys that are rescued and, and for the rest to be rescued. We're praying for that. Uh, continue to pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our president. Pray for whether you like him or not. Pray for him. That's a good thing, amen? Yep. Jesus says pray for your enemies. So, <laughs> that, I, I can't see my enemy, but I just, you know, there's people out there that are my enemy. <laughs> but Jesus tells me to pray for them and to pray for 
Pray for all people so we keep them lifted up and, and in prayer. Pray for, and, and I want to encourage you, if you pray for our congregation, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things that we're going we're gonna to be seeing happening here in the next few months, so we need, to, we need to be praying about that. So let's keep that in our prayers. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the joy of coming into your presence, and we thank you for the joy of the peace that surpasses all understanding. It guards our hearts and minds. You, Jesus, have promised us in your word that if we call out to you in your holy name, that you answer our prayers. Now, we know sometimes, Father, that that answer is not always yes, it will be. Sometimes the answer is wait. The timing is not right yet. And so we trust you in that. Sometimes the answer is no. And Lord, we don't always like to hear that word. But yet, we trust you. We trust you for the answer you give to us, whether the, this is in your will or this is outside your will. We're going to trust you for whatever you say to us as you guide us and lead us. We know for certain you, you never stop loving us. We know for certain that you're watching over us. And you're watching over those whom we pray for even now at this moment. You're watching over their their health and their well-being, you're watching over their, their standing and their sitting, they're going out and they're coming in. You're watching over all of that. So as we live and move and find our being in you, may we be the example of your grace and mercy in this world. May we show that love to others by exemplifying your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy, to whom all we encounter and even to those whom we pray for now. We pray for our nation and its leaders. We pray, we pray for our world and its leaders. We pray for those that know you and those that don't. We pray for those that follow false gods and those that have no God at all. We pray for your love and your mercy to to just ooze from us. To just shine and glow. That we would draw all people to you. Lord, we trust you for the, the finances of this congregation. We trust you for the leadership of this congregation. We trust you for the ministries of this congregation. We trust you for all things. As we move forward and sometimes not able to see what's over the next bridge, we know that you are there with us and you are already where we are going. And so may we encounter you along the way as we bring praise to you and as we lift our prayers for our, for our friends, for our families, for our homes, and for our world. Father, we pray for our, our military, for their families, and for all things we give you glory and praise. We ask all of these prayers in the name of Jesus, who has taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us open our hearts to hear the word of God. You can settle in, we have a long one. <laughs> uh, it comes from 1 Samuel 17. First, 4 through 11, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Palestine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had bronze, a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its rod point weighed 600 shekels. 
His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Palestine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Palestine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On the hearing of the Palestine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, Saul, 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 49. David said to Saul, Do not let no one lose heart on account of this Palestine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go and fight against this Palestine his, and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off his sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Palestine will not will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Palestine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around him, because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his shaft by the hand, in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. And with the sling in his hand, approached the Palestine. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Palestine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? The Palestine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Palestine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Palestine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves, for, battle of, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into his, our hands. As the Palestine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag, he took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Palestine in the forehead. The stone sank, sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. May God bless his blessing to the meaning of the reading of his word.
kind of battles were used to determine a nation's ruling over another nation or an army over another nation. And when the contest was ended, whoever won would rule over that losing army or would rule over even that losing nation. And that's exactly what we see here today. So today we hear about this match that is going on. However, this match kind of seems a little far-fetched when you, when you begin to look at it. You see the, the, uh, the saga come out. It, it's, it's this old story of, of a giant versus a smaller person. Now, have you ever seen a giant? Anybody ever seen a giant? And no, I'm not talking about the, uh, uh, the baseball team. Here. I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about the football team either, if you've seen the giant. But I am talking about the human kind of giant, and that's this guy here. This, these are, you know, not Photoshop. They didn't have that ability in those days. There are very, 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 very tall people. Usually you find them in, in the circus sideshows and that kind of thing. But <coughs> there are giants in our world. There are giants in your life right now. And the biggest challenge we have is with the situation we hear about today between David and Goliath. About how David faced this Philistine that, that came and taunted the Israelite army for around 40 days, it says. The Bible tells us that he was quite an impressive individual, an impressive human being. In 1 Samuel uh, 17, 4 through 7, it tells us something about this man's stats. So we're going to look at kind of a comparison chart here or there. He was about 9 foot 9 inches tall. He was approximately 175 pounds from what we understand. And when we go by the measurements in which describes his armor and so forth, uh, his army or his his armor weighed about oh 250 pounds, maybe 300 pounds, somewhere around there. He was no ordinary soldier. He had he had a javelin that just the pole alone weighed 15 pounds, and with the with the spear on the end of it, that was alone around 17 pounds. So you're talking a little over 30 pounds of this uh, this javelin alone to throw that. Can you imagine how heavy that would be? Uh, his armor was made of solid brass. So imagine this 10-foot dude stepping down from this, this hill, and with the sun behind him, I can almost imagine the, the sunrise, because it says he comes out early in the morning, so he would have come from the east, and he would have been standing there with the sun rising behind him in this all-brass armor. Can you imagine this guy glistening in the sun? This huge brass, you know, you want to talk about uh, C-3PO on steroids, <laughs> okay? This guy is huge and opposing, menacing. He is there. And it's no wonder he struck fear into the hearts of God's people. It's no wonder when you think about that. And so every day for 40 days he appeared and he just taunted the army. He would just come out and he would make his plea. Come on, send, send your champion, send your strongest warrior up here, and I will take him on. Come on. Terry, you want to do this? Take me on. Come on. <laughs> Terry's shaking. <laughs> Come on, Val. Come on, take me on. He's shaking. Jake, <laughs> you're about his size. <laughs> Come on. Can you see it? Every day he just comes and taunts. You are scared, he's saying. You are terrified. You, you're not going to win. I'll feed you to the birds. I'll feed you to the wild animals. There is no chance for you. And every day, Saul, the king, sat there and shuddered. I, I almost could imagine that Saul probably never even left his tent. He would just sit there and go, is he talking? Is he talking now? I don't want to go out there. I can almost see that. I can see these men just shaking in their armor, just terrified by the thought of this. 
And it must have looked like the Philistines would win this battle. It must have looked like it. They must have figured there's no one going to. He's going to reach the point saying, you know what? We won. Time's up. You had, you had the time to do this. You had the time to get someone in. I think it must have looked like the impossible. But you know, it wasn't the giant. It wasn't Goliath. That was the threat that endangered the Israel army. That wasn't the threat at all. It's not a giant that can threaten our lives either. And the greatest killers are often not giants. Think about that. If you're thinking of going to your favorite restaurant right after worship, I want to give you a a little thought here, food for thought, no pun intended, but I want you to consider the risk you're taking. Now, I'll, I'll get into that here in a minute, but according to a 2014 study, when you eat food out or you go to a restaurant, you double the risk of contracting foodborne disease more than eating at home. You double that. One in six of us will get food born illness this year. Isn't that exciting news? <laughs> I know you're already excited about that. And it happens more frequently than you really, than you imagine. And it's not uncommon to hear about a restaurant being shut down or being cited for, a, you know, getting a low score on, a, on their uh, evaluation or something like that. You know, anything less than, less than three, they say, don't go to that restaurant, should eat there. But, I need to be clear. I enjoy going to have dinner out. Do you? I do. I enjoy that. That's one of my favorite things. And I'm not bashing that. I'm just giving you some things. <coughs> so if you decide to go and eat somewhere after church, you know, call me later if you get sick and I'll say, see, I was right. <laughs> no, but that's, you know, there is a risk. There is a risk in, in any kind of food preparation, whether it's in your home or in a restaurant. There's always a risk. Chipotle Mexican Grill. Anybody ever hear of that place? Remember what happened to them a couple of years ago? You heard about that. That was a lot of fun. 55 cup. Now this it wasn't just one or two. 55 customers across 11 states contracted E. coli after eating one of the chains uh, at one of the chains, and they, that was a problem. The Chipotle uh, owned up to that fact. They knew it. There was. Uh, 80 customers at just one store in Boston a few months later that got really sick. And that's, you know, their stock prices took a crash. Um, their, their public image took a crash. I mean, every time I drove by one, I would see it and I'd go, I'm not even there. <laughs> I'm not over there. I don't want to get sick. And that's the mentality that they, they face. So what do you do in a situation like that? What do you do when your reputation is on the line? What do you do if your reputation is destroyed? What do you do if your reputation is just annihilated completely? When you look at what's going on here with the, the army of Israel, with Saul and, and the, the army, when you look at it, I think their reputation is in danger. Matter of fact, it's probably already destroyed after 40 days of taunting. You would think the Philistines think, oh, these guys are wimps. These guys are not going to do it. When, when word gets out that you're a wimp, when word gets out that you're a coward, when word gets out that you're terrified, terrified of just silly little things, when that gets out, what happens? People look at you differently. People think about you differently. They, they may not come right out and say it to you, but they don't treat you the same. How many know that's true? That gets out of that happens. So what if I told you there is a solution to what I would call the process of heading off the problems at the past? What if I told you there's a fix to that? Would you be interested? What if I told you there's a solution to that problem of, of being scared? Would you want to know how to fix that? Anybody here? Yes? No? Maybe? You can all say yes in the church. Yes. Amen? Yes. yes? Lois wants to know. Anybody else? 
Yes, they go oh, good. I've got a solution. Uh, you can order my book today, 1995. <laughs> <laughs> what if I told you in order to eradicate giants and not so giants in our life, would you be in, you could eradicate giants and not so giants, you would be interested, I think. I know I would. And that is simply called the kill set. Say that with me. The kill set. Say it again. The kill set. There's a kill set. Now, in food handling, it's one of the most important parts of the process of food safety. And the idea of the kill set is not only important to preparing food, it's also it's helping to keep your food safe and healthy and free from disease or germs and all that. But doing a little extra, extra preparation can help us in the spiritual realm to be ready for when those giants come in our lives. There's things that we can do. Instead of making excuses, Chipotle decided, you know what, we're going to fix this problem. They could have easily went out of business. They could have just closed down and said, forget it. We're not going to, you know, we're never going to recover from this. But they said, no, we're going to fix this problem. So they aggressively worked on this. They hired what they call a health, a health preparer, a food preparation guru. And he came in, and this guy set new standards and gave them the kill step that they needed to have in food preparation. They implemented so many food, food safety uh, improvements into their system. It included uh, how they handled the food, how, they, how the food was handled in their production facilities before it even hit the store. They even changed the air filtration system in their stores in order that airborne viruses would be eradicated. They, and they even implemented, which was surprising, I didn't know this, they even implemented, uh, they added to uh, their employees a uh, vacation time or sick day time. They didn't have sick days before, so they could come in and they could be, you know, and fixing your sandwich, yuck. <laughs> but they added this, and now, they have this, and they are one of the top-rated food safety. Matter of fact, they're a model now because of the kill step that they in, in, uh, initiated in that. For example, let me give you an idea. David is our example. David is our example, and doing that little preparation can help us to be ready, but David is the example. The example of this kind of kill step is David. You see, what David did was he showed to the army what they needed to know was the problem they were facing. You see, the problem wasn't Goliath. That is a problem, yeah. But that wasn't the problem. David proved to them that there was a kill step that he took care of long ago that made him ready for a moment such as this. This giant Philistine warrior named Goliath strode out every day and made his plea and made his demands and made his, his taunts. And the same thing, in the same way, the giants or the not-so-giants in our lives come at us every day and taunt us, scare us try to scare us. Those giants are not so giants. Come out and say, you're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You're not healthy enough. You're not old enough. You're too old. You're the wrong gender. You're the wrong person. Did you hear it? It's, it's not those tiny, oh, I hate spiders. Anybody else here hate spiders? i got to admit, I'm terrified of spiders. Please do not put spiders in my office. <laughs> Bad enough, there was some spiders on some of them Christmas trees. And I introduced them to Jesus really fast. <laughs> really fast. Here, hey, you know Jesus? You do now. <laughs> I'm telling you. Those things that get us terrified. We 
know how the story goes. David goes out to meet Goliath. He's armed only with five smooth stones. And he, he goes out there and he's going to deliver a kill step at that point. But the thing is, there was already a kill step that David initiated to be prepared for what he was going to face. Maybe grows through this, this time. He's prepared. He's been prepared. You see, it goes way back, but the point I want you to get is this. Two simple facts. First of all, David did what? He identified the problem. The problem he come out and he, he told Goliath, you know, he said, you know, you're a big old bad guy. You know, I'd use another word, but I won't in church. <laughs> you know? But he was about to open up a 55-gallon drum on him, right? <laughs> he was going to whoop him. And he knew it. What was it that gave David this little squirt about this big, soaking wet, probably 125 pounds? He couldn't even wait. He couldn't even hold the armor that Saul gave him. Can you see him kind of clunking around? Going, I can't move. I can't see. This helmet's too big. Take this stuff off me. He goes out there and all he's got is these five smooth, oops, five smooth stones. Say that five times fast. <laughs> five smooth stones, a sling. And more than that, there was a weapon he had that no army could defeat. He had a weapon that no evil could destroy. And it, it wasn't that all of a sudden he developed this weapon. He'd been working on it for a long time. But he goes out and he identifies the problem. He says, you know, big boy, you're not so hot. You're, you're taunting us. You're taunting me. And, and you're taunting this army, and you, you think you're all that. But here's the weapon David delivered. He says, I come at you with the power of God. I'm coming at you with a power that will never be defeated. Amen? I'm coming at you with something will defeat you like that. Now, yes, he identified the problem. You're a problem because you don't, you don't follow our God and you, you, you mock our God and I'm about to show you. You don't take lightly to that. But the problem wasn't that. He identified the problem as the army was scared because they forgot who God was. They had seen God be faithful before. How many have ever seen God faithful before? You all have seen it. Amen? God has been faithful. God pulled you out of that situation that was impossible. Amen? God brought a different result for the test. Amen? God gave you peace when there was no peace. Amen? God surrounded you with people that you didn't think cared, and all of a sudden they showed up with everything they had. Amen? God was faithful. And even if God said no, and even if God said, I'm not going to do that, I won't do that, and it's not time for that, God still provided what you needed, amen? David identified the problem. He said it to the army, he said it to Saul, he said, what's wrong with you guys? <coughs> what's wrong with you? Our God's greater than this guy, and you're scared? What are you doing in here shaking. Any one of you could go face that guy with the faith that I have. You see, David didn't just develop that faith like that. He even tells Saul, he said, while I was out in the wilderness taking care of sheep, when a lion came along, I took him out. When there was a problem with a bear, I took him out. I got ready for this. I used the kill steps to get ready for this one. Amen? 
Did you see it? You see, all the things that you've been going through has been getting you ready for the next thing. Everything that you're, you're traveling through right now, God has been getting you ready for the next one. Oh, come on, amen? Now, the thing is, you might be thinking to yourself, well, maybe I haven't been training so well. <laughs> amen? amen? God says, get to training. You see, God at times will put a Goliath in your, in your path in order to reveal the David within you. Did you know there's a David within you? There's a David in every single one of you. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Tell your neighbor, I see David in you. I see David in you. I see David in you. Come on, tell him. It's okay to talk to your neighbor, but not through the whole service. <laughs> You know, the only, the only thing that can control our fear is us. God can't control our fear. God won't control our fear. We control our fear. He gives us the ability to do that. He gives us peace. He shows himself. He shows himself faithful. And that should calm our fear. And so that leads me to this one. Draw on your blood. You've seen God in the past, amen? Oh, come on. God's been with you, amen? amen? He's been with you. And he's been there. He has walked with you through the back of the shadow of death, amen? amen? And you have drawn on the words, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. God is there. And David drew on his experience. He says, I've been, out in the, I've been out in the wilderness. I've experienced that. This guy is nothing compared to what I've experienced out there. So that's why David could do what he did. That's why David could face what he faced. Now, how many know not every giant is huge? <laughs> you know why we make little things in our lives into giants? Because our focus is out of perspective. We get our focus out of out of out of sync. See, there's things that can kill us that we can't even see, amen? And it's not always bacteria. <coughs> Doubt can kill you, amen. Unbelief. Fear. It's not always a little bad. But if you you draw on your experience. You will remember God was faithful. And here's the thing that I always tell people. I, I every once in a while I'll have somebody to come in and it's just or talk to me or whatever, and they will say, Pastor, I'm scared. And I said, I get it. I understand you're scared. I've been there, and I've been there, and I will be there again probably someday. But you know how I get through it? I point back and say, God, you were there with me at one time. You were there with me last time. And here's what I say. If God was there before, why will God not be there again? Jesus even says this. God even says this. Prove me faithful. Test me. And I will show you. You see, God at times will put a Goliath in your path in order to reveal the David within you. Point right there. There's a David within you. Sometimes it looks all bigger than it really is. But we can conquer our lives. We can conquer them. We can have the confidence of knowing God is on our side no matter what the problem is we face. Whatever problem you're facing right now, whatever it is you're looking at, some experience in your past will be where you draw upon. There is something in your past that you can look back to and say, God, you were there. You will be there again. God at times will put a Goliath in your path in order to reveal the David in you. You know, our fear magnifies the giant. Our fear makes it bigger than it really is. God doesn't magnify it. We do. But if we look at it, if we 
we look at it through the lens of faith, then we can trust God for the results, and God will deliver. David trusted God for those results, and God delivered him. So today, use that show step. Trust God where it seems impossible. Lean on your experience. Those are the kill steps that prepare you for whatever it is you're going to face. Maybe you're facing something right now. Look back at God and says, I was there and I'm here. Draw upon that experience. Draw upon that, that knowledge. You will find that those five smooth stones are all you need to conquer whatever giant you're facing right now. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, helping us to trust you. David trusted you, and David trusted you for the for the results. David trusted you for the, the direction. And Lord, you gave him the strength he needed. Just as uh, we need that strength right now, help us to remember that we can follow you and rely upon you for all things, no matter what's coming. You know, the greatest killers are often not the ones that are nine feet tall. Sometimes they can only be seen in a microscope. But we know that you can even eradicate them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So our band comes to prepare uh, for our uh, time of offering. Our ushers will come. Let us give generously as uh, the Lord has been given to us. Don't forget about the opportunity to support uh, some of our young folks uh, through uh, uh, your giving for Vacation Bible School. Let's keep that uh, as a part of your giving if you'd like to do that. If you need more information, talk to Denise uh, or I after the service and we'll let you know what that's all about. But let us give as God has given to us. Amen.
Sorry. Where's Charlie? Set me out.
character. He looked back at how faithful God was. He faced the cross with faith. The same faith that David had when he faced that giant in his life. Jesus faced the giant of our sins on the cross. He even faced death. The giant of death for our sin. So that we don't have to face it with fear. But we can face it with confidence. And so as we go forth from here, identify that problem. Identify those things that are pushing those buttons in your life scaring you and ask yourself is it bigger than my God? I think God's bigger than your problem. Amen? Bigger than, God's bigger than no matter what. So go forth with the peace and the promise and the hope that you can face all things because yes, God will place a giant in your path or a Goliath in your path in order to reveal the David that lives within you. Let that David out today in faith. Let that Jesus out today. Go in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.